Now today, I'll be talking you through the first lesson of the language and technology scheme of work that's been placed on uh, the Google Drive. Primarily because, um, as I said on Show My Homework, the, the lessons are fine, but they're not necessarily the easiest to follow if you don't know what you're looking at. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes just kind of talking you through the slides and also giving you time at the end of each slide where you might have work to do to, to do that work and kind of follow along. Now, just a reminder that language and technology in and of itself is not a module or a question you're asked, but it kind of comes under the remit of language and the media. That means that power, gender, and technology are all applicable to um, the question on paper two, which is language and the media. The first task, as you can see, is just to consider the different ways you've used technology to communicate today. But I'd also like you to consider how many different ways has technology communicated with you? At the end of each slide where there's a task, I'll try and give a five second kind of window of space so you can pause, do the task, and then come back to the video. So when I first did this lesson, I'd gone into my car and I'd seen these two images here, so I took photos of them, just to show us really that technology is all around us. And actually, whilst we might use phones, um, WhatsApp, Twitter, things like that to communicate, technology also communicates with us. And even though these pictures seem quite sort of sort of standard and quite basic, they do show representations of communication and ideas such as multimodality, the idea of text and image working together. There's genre conventions, the idea that these are the ways that we communicate things such as um, radio stations in the top left and the bottom right ideas about um, how we might show you know, airbags and seatbelts. Um, values related to safety, the fact that we even have to have these um, implies a society that values this um, need for, for for, for a warning to do with these things. The audience, the fact that the audience will know potentially what's been going on, even the fact that the audience, if you're looking at the top left corner, the fact that BBC Radio 4 is on, the fact that that might imply something about the person who is listening to the radio itself. Um, the cultural understanding of signs and meanings, the idea that actually sometimes the meaning of these signs may be different depending on where you are. They might not have a universal sign. The American sign for seatbelt on or radio may be different, perhaps. And then just the connotations, the idea that, you know, the red um, sign for the seatbelt and the orange sign for the... For the uh, the safety bag being deployed basically are kind of warning colours that kind of symbolise the fact that we might need to be concerned about something. So this is more of a reminder just about how this is uh, structured in terms of assessment objectives. As you can see, AO2 and AO3. So AO1's missing. So AO1's your language assessment objective. However, it is still mentioned in the specification. So just quickly read through that. So it says here, obviously, AO2 is to demonstrate critical understanding of concepts and issues relevant to language use for 12 marks. And then analyze and evaluate how contextual factors and language features are associated with the construction of meaning, 12 marks. So basically, conceptually and theoretically, why language is being used and how it relates to genre, purpose, audience, production, and reception. Now, it doesn't have an AO1, but as you can see in the specification, it does say uh, requires learners to apply language concepts and theories to their analysis of linguistic and graphological features. So linguistic and graphological features is where the language is. You can't talk about this without talking about patterns of language. At the bottom, you'll see the other two questions that make up this paper. Child language, 20 marks. Language change, 36 marks. As you can see, language in the media therefore sits nicely in the middle and is, you know, they're all important, of course, but um, some of them require slightly more in terms of um, output from you. Your example question will look like this. You're advised to spend about 45 minutes on this section, read text B in the resource booklet and answer the following question. Using your understanding of relevant ideas and concepts, investigate how language features and contextual factors construct meanings in this text. This will always be the same. The only thing that changes is the text. It will always be text B, but the text itself will, will change. Spend a few minutes. What are the key ideas and what do you think you're being assessed on? Similar to the example question, here's just an example mark scheme. Primarily, this is just for you to have a bit of a look at yourself and sort of see the differences between what you expected. Generally, I always cut the top three bands out because anything over that starts to push towards your C's, your B's, and your A's. Um, a level four mark would be sound level of knowledge and using the knowledge in, uh, to comment on some language features. You've got good knowledge if you're level five and you've got an assured knowledge. Generally, all that changes, the skill stays the same, but the ability of the skill. So as I said, sound, good, and assured. Do spend some time having a look at that, but don't get too bogged down in the mark scheme necessarily. Just focus on the fact that it is AO2 and it's AO3. 
Now, this is a useful task to do at the start of this session um, in terms of like the session, in terms of the scheme of work, mainly because it gets you thinking a little bit about your own use of language. As you can see on the table, there are the five language levels. So you have Lexis, Grammar, Discourse, Pragmatics, Phonetics and Phonology. And on the top, you have Speech, Writing, Email and Text Message slash Instant Message. Now, that might also incorporate things like WhatsApp or Snapchat or whatever you see fit. I mean, you use it how you want to. I'd like you to spend, and it does take maybe 15 to 20 minutes, just working out how these things are different or similar depending on the mode of communication. So how is your Lexis used, or how do you use Lexis in speech? How do you use grammar in speech? Discourse, pragmatics, phonetics, and phonology. You should therefore come up with something of a, a, a kind of a, a, you know, a collection of your own personal use of language related to these three, dif uh, to these four very, very different forms of communication. An example would be, uh, we talked in the past, grammar and speech, you're more likely to use compound sentences or minor sentences or non-standard forms because the nature of speech is we're not always thinking when we're talking, we're kind of speaking quite spontaneously and it lends itself to that. You should be able to sort start to see some patterns. I mean, are emails kind of similar to speech or writing? Do text messages and, and instant messages have any similarities between any of the other three? Um, you know, you'll start to see where there's patterns. You'll start to see where there's things that are similar and different. So do have a look at those. As I said, roughly about 20 minutes. On the next slide are sort of answers that we came up with in um, last year's lessons. So give yourself the 20 minutes and then skip on to the next slide. Now, as always, I'm not going to pretend that these are the only things that you could have found, but here is a collection of stuff. And I mean, some of it's quite straightforward for the idea, for example, the idea of, you know, discourse of writing being in paragraphs. But then when you start to compare it against things like the fact that when we speak, we might have adjacency pairs, you might do questions and answers, you could have greetings and de-greetings, which you looked at. Um, similarly, the idea of grammar, the fact that we might have speech having compound and symbol, like we mentioned, but then writing becomes complex. An email, generally, will be more grammatically correct, perhaps, than a text message, which tries to mimic speech. So again, more likely to be compound and simple, more likely to have fragments of sentences. None of these should be potentially uh, shocking or, or strange, but they are worth acknowledging, because obviously they are very, very different modes of communication. To finish off the lesson, all I wanted you to do was considering that text can be seen as a written presentation of speech, which of the modes of writing, letter, text message or email, do you think is closest to speech or talking? And it just says here, write a response using your ideas from across the lesson to support your reasoning. So when I say write a response, I just want you to kind of, I guess, comment and sort of summarise your ideas based on other things you've seen in the lesson. Primarily the task you just did, where you kind of quantified how you utilise language across four different modes. That's it for the lesson, really. That should take you sort of roughly, I guess, sort of, you know, 45 minutes to an hour if you're doing it properly. Uh, as always, any questions, any concerns, please do let me know. If you're not sure of anything, obviously do just email me. And my plan is really silly to try and get these up ASAP because I know that a lot of you will be getting on with this. So the next one will come in the next few days, I hope. Anyway, I hope you find this useful. Talk to you soon.